Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, real pleasure to be here this afternoon in the Ivy. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it's a definite first for me, A, being in the Ivy before 6 p.m. in the evening, um, and also not having a glass of wine in my hand at the same time. So, uh, but, uh, but notwithstanding that, I'd like to welcome you to the Bank West uh, 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 Connect series. And for those of you that aren't aware, the Connect series are, are a series of networking events that are really aimed at um, promoting networking and sharing thoughts, thought leadership around uh, emerging trends and things that are impacting the business environment in which we're all operating. Now, my name's Andy Weir. I'm the Chief Executive for Enterprise Services and the Chief Information Officer at Bank West. And as well as uh, having the general role of keeping the lights on for the organization, uh, my role's also around how do we ensure that an organization like Bank West is also keeping at the forefront of those business and technological trends. Now, in these, in these Connect series of events, we typically hear from some of the foremost commentators uh, on emerging trends, and I can promise you today will be no different in that regard. But before we get on to the subject matter that we're going to cover today, I'd first like to talk to you about uh, one of our charity partners for the Bank West Connect series, and that's the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And I'm sure all of you will be all too aware of the fantastic work that the Flying Doctor Service provides um, in providing emergency and, uh, and essential health services for people who live, work and travel in the Australian outback. Now, to help this fantastic cause, we're going to be don donating $5 for every single event evaluation that we receive from this afternoon's uh, event. Now, um, in order to do that, uh, when we get to the drinks and networking at the end, some of the uh, uh, event uh, coordinators will be walking around with an iPad application looking something like this, um, and they'll be asking you to complete that evaluation with them there and then. And for every one of those that gets completed, we'll be donating $5 to a fantastic cause. Um, and just to give you uh, something to aim for, from the last series of Connect events, we managed to raise over $1,600 for that fantastic cause, and I'm sure we can start to beat that uh, from today. So on to today's subject. Um, the topic is centered around what we've referred to as the evolution of the multi-channel customer. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that technology and the number of channels in which uh, customers wish to conduct business is growing at a phenomenal rate. The rapid evolution of technology and the proliferation of mobile devices and digital technologies in general really provide challenges to all Australian businesses. Armed with unlimited information at their fingertips, always on customers are moving faster than ever with increasing expectations around where, when, and how they want to interact with businesses. Now these, uh, and with the modern marketplace becoming even more and more complex and challenging, even the most savvy of Australian businesses are trying to remain relevant in the digital age. Now these trends throw some really interesting questions and challenges up for organizations of all shapes and sizes. For example, what's the role of face-to-face -face communication in a future digital age? How can we expect to see these trends emerging and change over the next five years? And what businesses um, need to do to be successful embracing changing customers' experiences and expectations in each of the channels that we operate. So who better to help us understand and face into these challenges than the best-selling author on generational, generation and business trends, the author Michael McQueen. Michael understands what it takes to thrive in a rapidly evolving world, having dedicated the last eight years to tracking the dominant trends shaping society, business and culture. He has helped some of the world's best known brands navigate change and stay in front of the curve. Michael features regularly as a commentator on both television and radio and has written three best-selling books. He's a familiar face also on the international conference circuit and has shared the stage with no, others, uh, no less others than Bill Gates, Whoopi Goldberg and Larry King. 
Uh, he's also promised to add me to that list after today's uh, event. Now, there will be a Q&A at the end uh, of, Michael's, uh, of Michael's session, and I'd ask you to please uh, pay close attention, listen really carefully, and ask questions, because we will be awarding some prizes to the best questions that get, get asked in the Q&A. So, without further ado, it gives me enormous privilege and pleasure to introduce Mr. Michael McQueen. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're, um, we're going to get started because we've actually got a lot of ground to cover in a very short space of time this afternoon. As you heard, you've got Q&A and then probably that glass of wine will actually come out after Q&A. So I want to make sure we, we stick to time if we can. But we are going to have some fun as we go along this afternoon. We're actually going to kick off our time today with a bit of a game. And this game is going to be called Bankruptcy Bingo. So in a few moments, I'm going to put up on the screen a series of clues. And these clues relate to four brands that have filed for bankruptcy in fairly spectacular fashion over the last few years. And you can, like, you can work in groups of two or three, okay? But once you've guessed all four brands, I want you to yell out bingo. Are you ready? Are you set? Okay, the four clues are up on the screen. Go for it. Yell out bingo when you've guessed all four. Bingo. Bingo already. You got bingo. Very good. Okay. The four brands on the screen are? Kodak. Kodak. Borders, Payless Shoes, Payless Shoes. Allen's Music, Gold Star. Well done. Okay, there'll be prizes later, but you perhaps should have got a prize now and one person clapped. That was very kind. <laughs> well done. How affirming of you. Now, here's the thing. Those four brands, if you think about it, those four brands are far from alone. In the last probably 18 months, we've seen what, what could be described as an epidemic of extinction in the business community. I mean, have a look at some of the other brands on the screen that if they're not bankrupt yet, they're sort of heading that way pretty quickly. And think of the significance of some of those brands. I mean, Kodak, for instance, we talked about them a moment ago. They are a 131-year-old company. Do you know in the 80s, Kodak was one of the, the, one of the top three most identifiable brands on earth. There was McDonald's, there was Coke. And then there was Kodak. And yet that's a business today that is fighting for any semblance of, of survival. I mean, you think about a brand like Blackberry, and perhaps someone's just rang on cue. Well done. Um, how many of you here use a Blackberry phone? Hands up. Often not very proud to show that they use Blackberry phones. How many of you have ever owned a Blackberry phone? Hands up. Wow, look at the difference in numbers. I mean, you look at Blackberry as a brand. In the US, they had just over 40% market share six years ago. Today it's about eight. And look how quickly this can happen, how quickly the fortunes of a brand can turn around. And as Andy just said, the last eight years, most of my research has been around what is happening in society. So the sort of trends that are affecting organizations and leaders and how you need to respond to those trends. The last probably 18 months or so, though, have been focused on um, two questions in my research. First question is, why are so many of the world's most successful businesses dropping like flies? And secondly, second question is, what can we do to ensure we don't end up in the same position? I mean, you're all here as, as you know, leadership of organizations, teams, brands. How can you be sure that in 10 years' time, your brand isn't amongst the list up on the screen? It's a fairly compelling thought, really. Okay, and the reality is, well, we, we look at each of these businesses, and they're all from very different industries, very different product lines. The one thing they each have in common is that they have fallen from greatness because of two words. And those two words are these, because shift happens. Right? Truly, stuff changes. And you've got businesses that are successful, that are prominent, and then something happens. It's like the goalposts get moved. And the challenge is, it's like these massive businesses with all this inertia and momentum. You know, they see the iceberg on the horizon, but they're going so fast and they're so big they often can't steer fast enough, and then they hit that iceberg head on, and it's game over for many of these businesses. And we've talked already this afternoon about the fact that shift is happening, and you know, we're going to talk particularly about shifts in technology, because there is no doubt. In fact, every week you will hear of a business or a brand or a product that is becoming irrelevant because of the onward march of technology. And so we'll talk about technological shifts first. And you know, everywhere you look, of course, these are having an impact. Now look, for instance, at an industry like the video hire business and how that has been completely obliterated in the last three years. I was at a social function recently talking to a young guy and I asked him what he did. And he said, I was probably 26, 27 years of age, and um, he said, oh, I've just, um, I've just bought into a video easy 
franchise on the Central Coast. And I'm thinking, how do you say to someone, without being rude, are you mad? Like, why would you do that? I mean, think of what this 26, 27-year-old guy's done. He's saved up his cash. He might have got a loan. He's gone into business and he's paid to step on board a sinking ship. And it's not that we don't watch movies anymore. It's just that we do it so differently. I mean, the last month, how many of you have gone into a physical video hire store to rent a movie or a TV series to watch? Three of you, four of you. <laughs> and you look so proud to have done so at the back. <laughs> You're like, oh man. Okay, how many of you in the last month have streamed or downloaded a movie or a TV show? Well, the proof's in the pudding. I won't ask how many of them were legal downloads. That's a slightly awkward question. Yeah, but this is the reality. When we talk about multi-channel consumers, I mean, we've got options. We've got options now we didn't have three years ago. We'll have more options in three years' time than we've got today. And the challenge for businesses is there are a whole pile of shifts that are happening in the realm of technology. And we're going to talk about three very quickly. And I'll, I'll say up front, these three shifts can be confronting. They can be politically inconvenient, they can be uncomfortable for a lot of businesses, but they are the reality, so let's talk about them. Okay, the first shift that we're going to see in the, in the coming few years that's going to change the, the nature of businesses and how we operate is um, the death of the gatekeeper. The death of the gatekeeper, the middleman, the intermediary. Because think about it, 10 years ago, if you wanted to buy something, you had very few channels, very few options by which you could do that. Middlemen, intermediaries, gatekeepers were necessary because they, they were the interface between a customer and the supplier or the wholesaler. They were a key element of the distribution process. And yet today, of course, we've got so many options, we can go straight to the supplier or the wholesaler and middlemen, gatekeepers are in a position where they've got to very quickly reinvent themselves reinvent their value proposition or they'll go from being irreplaceable to irrelevant very quickly. And I was speaking at a, a, a conference, a national conference for a group of financial planners about three months ago and you can just imagine how thrilled they were to hear um, that message. Um, and yet the reality is I said to them and it's a challenge for so many industries, if all you are offering is a transactional solution or education to your clients, which for most financial planners that's sort of what they did, they, they informed and they did the transactions. So if that's all you're doing, Consumers can do that now without your help. Now let's confront that reality and say, well now how do you add value in a different way rather than just clip the ticket cost when it comes to distribution? And there are lots of industries in that, in that boat. I mean, think of the travel industry. The world, worldwide study done across 12 countries, 12,000 consumers last year, where consumers were asked about their travel booking habits. Of those 12,000 consumers, two thirds said that when they book a holiday, their first port of call is the web. They don't bother going into the local travel agency to get a couple of brochures and find out, you know, what time of year is the best time to go. First thing they do is jump onto TripAdvisor or Expedia or Webjet. And here's the thing, of those two-thirds of consumers, 48% of them will then go ahead and make a purchase from the supplier directly, the hotel, the airline, the tour provider. And those middlemen suddenly are cut out. The challenge for them is how do they reinvent themselves? Now, you look at how the death of the gatekeeper is affecting the retail sector. I mean, last year, of course, David Jones and Meyer somewhat bled. I mean, things are tough. I mean, one of the stats I saw late last year in the wash-up of, of, the, of the calendar year, David Jones's net profits fell 40% in 12 months. And there are lots of factors involved in that. You look at currency differentials and a whole pile of stuff. You know, the biggest thing that's affecting, of course, the retail sector can be summed up in one word. And it's a word that is a term that was only coined last year. And it's the term of showrooming. I don't know if you've heard of this term. It describes the phenomenon by which consumers will now go into a store to try on the garment or smell the perfume or play with the gadget. And that the first thing they do is jump online, often before they've even left the store, to see how much is it online. Often they'll make the purchase before they've even left the change room. There was a big ski retailer in Melbourne last year that said they were so fed up with this. You know, people coming in and they'd, they'd take up 50 minutes of a store person's time and they'd try on the ski boots and the clothes and the gloves and they'd write everything down, all the sizes and brands and colours. They'd go and order them online. This ski, this ski retailer is now charging $300 to try stuff on in their shop. Will it work? It's questionable. Okay, I'm not sure that punishing customers is the way to encourage them to use your service, but you, know, you have to pay 300 bucks, and if you buy from them, then you get that $300 back. And yet that's an admirable pursuit, trying to somehow combat this. Now, let's be clear. You know, competitive shopping or shopping around is not new. 
And yet we can do it in so many different ways. And also we're seeing providers of these services further up the chain being far more aggressive than they ever used to be. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Amazon Price Check app. It's a fascinating piece of technology. Amazon spent 12 months building the world's largest database of barcodes and prices. And if you download the Amazon Price Check app, you can now go into a store, scan the barcode. It will tell you in real time, based on your geographical location, whether you can get that item $3 cheaper down the road or online. Now, that is somewhat of a challenge. Because for retailers who are just competing on price, I mean, you look at what, what's the, what have been the weapons in their arsenal the last 12 months. We'll just keep discounting and discounting and discounting. And it's pretty hard to out-discount a store called Amazon that doesn't have wages and staff and all the rest of the stuff. And so, you know, as the gatekeeper gets eroded as a role, of course, businesses have to respond. The second, um, the second technology trend is the death of paper. I don't know if you heard the news last year that 2012 would be the final year that the Encyclopedia Britannica would be printed in book form. Now, think about this as a precedent. 248 years in a row, every year they print it. Last year, that was it. Now, we really shouldn't be very surprised by this, because you think about it, in the last 20 years, how many of you have actually purchased a set of Encyclopedia Britannica? Hands up. The tumbleweed blow through the room. Oh, you've, you've done it. Okay, one set of encyclopedias. Now, of course, this is actually, you guys are pretty representative of the marketplace as a whole. This has been their trajectory over the last two decades. Their high watermark was 1990. But then a few years later, shift happened. Technological shift happened. It was in the form of Microsoft Encarta. Anyone of my vintage will remember when Encarta 95 came out. How awesome that was for school assignments. We discovered cut and paste. And then the teachers also <laughs> discovered cut and paste. Yeah, but what, a, what a revolution. On one disc, you could get all that information contained in those dusty volumes of books that went out of date almost immediately. And then Microsoft Encarta itself was bumped off by Google and then Wikipedia. And in, you know, Britannic is not alone. You know, this morning, in fact, I was meeting with my publisher for one of my books, and he said, he's in crisis. He has no idea what to do. They are about to pulp 10,000 books. A whole range of cookbooks they have. He said, we can't give them away. Now, why is no one buying books? Because they're all getting it electronically. Last year, Amazon, for the first time, sold more e-books than they did paperbacks and hardcover books combined. Think of that. A technology that didn't even exist three or four years ago. This was, um, this was brought home for me on the weekend. I was helping a friend move. And um, I was helping them move their boxes of books. There were two boxes of books. And her and her husband are a voracious readers. And I said, where are all your books? And she said, well, we gave most of them away. She said, I haven't bought a book in three years. Everything I buy is for Kindle. HarperCollins last year sold their last two warehouses. No longer are they in the book distribution business because it's an un viable business model. We see the same challenge for newspapers. Rupert Murdoch's upbeat. The rest of the world is not so upbeat when it comes to newspapers. You see it in magazines. Last year, of course, Newsweek magazine in December printed their last edition after 80 years of continual publication. And in a very stunning admission, the CEO of National Geographic last October said this. He's in the Wall Street Journal. He said, the idea of a printed magazine will inevitably cease entirely. Today, National Geographic makes more than half of their revenue from their television joint ventures and the bulk of the rest of it's from online subscriptions and iPad subscriptions, not through printed magazines. That's a complete flip from 10 years ago. Now, the third shift we're seeing technologically is the death of the desktop. You know, I do a lot of stuff with school teachers, and last year I was running a session for a group of primary school teachers in Lindfield from a whole lot of the surrounding schools. The kindergarten teacher said that she teaches kindergarten kids computer studies, which I thought was irrelevant. Why would you teach kindergartners? Any of you who've got toddlers would know that computer studies, you would think, is not something they need to learn, because like four months out of the womb, like they're good with an iPad, right? They're set to go. I don't know if you, you speak about magazines. I don't know if you saw that clip on YouTube a few months ago of the three-year-old was playing with one of her mum's magazines, and she was sliding her finger across this magazine, trying to figure out why it wouldn't unlock, because, you know, for this little toddler, iPads are more ubiquitous than magazines, and yet this, this kindergarten teacher was telling me the last two years are the first two years where she has to now teach toddlers how to use a mouse. These toddlers are coming into the classroom for computer studies lessons and they have no clue what a mouse is or how to use it. Now they're very tech savvy, but you know, they've spent their whole lives swiping. You know, desktop configurations are a foreign beast to many of these young kids. 
And um, if you look at the data society-wide, not just in younger generations, some research done a couple of years back found the number of people who are using tablet or handheld devices to browse the internet as their primary browsing method is going through the roof. To give you an idea, 70% of consumers in Egypt, there's just one market, rarely or never use a desktop computer to browse the web. Now, India, one of the big hotspots for the next 30 years, 59% of consumers hardly ever, if ever, use a de desktop computer. Come down to the line, we've got the US, the UK, Australia's not there, but we'd be around the 20 to 25% mark. The challenge, of course, as a business, is if your web solutions are geared towards desktop users, if your website isn't easily usable on a handheld or tablet device, you're missing a sizable percentage of your market in the Asian century. Now, you know, we're all here talking about the evolving consumer. It's important we actually talk about not just the technology-related stuff, but the consumer as a whole. And it's not just technological shifts we need to be aware of, it's demographic shifts too. And this is the area I've spent the bulk of my time in the last eight years looking at. How is the shape of our society changing, and what does that mean for businesses, particularly the influence of this demographic cohort here, a group called Generation Y? And I don't know what your experience of Gen Y is. I tell you, they are a fascinating bunch. Um, yeah, I actually um, spent three years, starting in 2004, I spent three years interviewing over 80,000 Gen Y people right around the world to get a sense of what is going on in this group's heads. In fact, and you heard about um, this book, um, The New Rules of Engagement, and really my goal with this book um, back in 2007 was to capture that stuff. I and mean, what is going on in this youth target market? And I want to put it to you, this is a generation of consumers who, for them, the multi-channel experience is normal, it's their default. They've never known anything different. They are a group of consumers that, I mean, they're buying different things in different ways and for different reasons. And you look at the mu music business, for instance. Last year, AC Nielsen did a study to ask teenagers how they listen to music these days. The top way that young people today listen to music is not Spotify, it's not iTunes, nor is it Pandora, it's YouTube. Two-thirds of teenagers said YouTube is their primary medium for listening to music today, and they're doing so for free. And in a sense, we've returned to the days of Napster, where you can listen to music with no charge at all, and the music companies, they are in a flutter. They've got no idea what to do, and how do you control this when YouTube is so big and so difficult to police or manage? And I want to put it to you, this is a generation of young people you cannot afford to ignore. A couple of reasons. Number one, they're massive. There are five and a half million Gen Ys in Australia. That means they are only marginally smaller than the baby boomers. This group have huge numbers, but not only are they just in, in numerically significant, they are economically significant too. Now, the Australian Centre for Retail Studies based at Monash University did some research two years ago which found that Gen Y, get this, they possess 50 cents in the dollar of discretionary spending in Australia right now. 50 cents in the dollar. Now, why are they so, why are they so cashed up? Any guesses why they might have so much cash? They're still living at home is the answer to that question. Um, 26 years of age is the average age for moving out of home for a Gen Y um, because why would you get a mortgage when the homes are bigger than they've been before? You've got privacy and freedom and independence, so they stay at home, save up, go on holidays instead of moving out. Okay, so the third reason you can't ignore this group is because they're discerning. It's often said that Gen Y have a finely tuned BS meter. Who knows what a BS meter is? Hands up. Okay, if you don't, the first word is bull. The second word starts with the letter S and you can connect the dots, but it's true. The very first hint of inconsistency, hypocrisy, this group sniff it a mile off. We saw this morning in the news that Domino's have had a bit of a, a challenging time. They had this big beat up about they were going to revolutionise, democratise the world of pizzas. And yet it seems to have been a whole lot of you know, froth and bubble as opposed to real substance. And the challenge with Generation Y is they are very aware of marketing tricks. They are very aware of the tactics companies employ. And so if you're going to connect with this generation of multi-channel users, here's the key. Market through them, not to them. The best way to get a message to this emerging generation of consumers is to use the established networks they've already got set up and market through them by letting them get the message out. Don't just buy an ad on Facebook. It's not sufficient. They're too smart for that. So we talked about a number of trends, a number of shifts. Of those four, be it the death of the gatekeeper, the death of paper, the death of the desktop, or emerging generations, which of those four, in your own context, is going to influence your business the most in the coming few years? Maybe just with the person next to you for 20 seconds or so, which of those is the most significant for you, and perhaps in what way? 20 seconds, share that with the person next to you. Go for it.
Okay, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, let's do a quick straw poll here. How many of you thought it was the first one, the death of the gatekeeper was the biggest challenge for you in the coming few years? Okay, only a handful. How many of you think it's the death of paper, which is a challenge for you? All right, just one, two, three. What's that, sorry? Challenge or opportunity is a good question. We're talking about challenges at the moment. How does it challenge the status quo? Because that's the thing that, it's the pain point, of course. Um, number three, how many of you think it is the death of the desktop, which is a challenge for you? A couple of you. How many of you think it's emerging generations? <laughs> All right, look at that. Lots more. All right. Well, and the point about is it a challenge or opportunity is the valid one. Because the reality is, while it's good to study some of the threats and the changes and talk about why some of the world's biggest businesses are becoming irrelevant, I reckon a far better question than the question of why do the mighty fall is the question, why do the enduring prevail? What is it about some businesses and brands that allows them to navigate changing environments and actually emerge stronger as opposed to victims of those things? When you look at IBM, you look at McDonald's, you look at Volvo, these are all brands that have had their ups and downs but have managed to stay enduringly relevant. What do they do that's different? And there are three things that enduring brands do, and you know, hopefully if you've got a pen and paper, you may want to write these down as we go through nice and quick. The first thing that enduring brands are constantly doing is they're constantly re-engineering, changing internal processes and systems as times and needs evolve. Now, that's easy to say, just change the way you do stuff. That's hard to do, though. And we'll look at one of the reasons why it can be so hard to re-engineer a business as the marketplace shifts. Um, how many of you remember a game from when you were kids called Rock, Paper, Scissors? Remember this game from when you were kids? We're going to have a quick game of Rock, Paper, Scissors here this afternoon. So you're going to have the best of three rounds. So with your neighbour, turn to them, put your fists out in front, ready to go. We're round number one, okay? Ready, fist out, round number one, and one, two, three. Okay, round number two, and one, two, three. All right, this is the decider. Are you ready? Round number three, and one, two, Two, three. All right. Now, those of you who just came first, those of you who just won, you're going to be the talkers for the next few moments in your little pair there. Those of you, we're going to call it coming second as opposed to having lost. It's like in schools. There's no such thing as failure anymore. It's now called deferred success because it's, it's kind of a self-esteem. So um, those of you who came second, you're going to be the listeners in your little pair now. So what I want you to do if you're the talkers, if you won just then, is I want you to spend 20 seconds and tell your partner, describe to your partner the process for you step by step of you know, getting in your car at home and driving to the end of your street. 20 seconds, describe that process. Go for it. Ten seconds to go, ten seconds to go. Five seconds, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, those of you who were the listeners just then, this is your chance to shine, your moment. I hope you're ready for your moment. All right, have a look at the screen and um, have a look at the list on the screen. Tell me if your partner there missed at least one of those steps. <laughs> Anyone have a partner that missed all nine of those steps? Who missed all nine? Anyone? <laughs> a couple of you. Now, the reality is, I'm guessing that you did most of these things this morning if you drove to the end of your street. But the challenge is, we do so much in life and in business completely on autopilot, completely unconsciously. And the challenge you face is before you can re-engineer how you do things, is actually to become aware of the stuff you already do. And when I'm working with clients, particularly in more of a, a consulting capacity, and we'll spend half a day or so doing this, I'll actually help them re-engineer a system or a series of systems. So to pick a system or process in their business and go through just a simple four-step exercise. The first step is to deconstruct that system. So to get a big piece of paper or whiteboard and list out from beginning to end every single step involved in that system. And what's interesting is when clients do this, they actually look at that list and go, are you serious? We do all of those things every single time? But again, so many of the steps are you know, unconscious. We're not even aware we're doing them. We're in a, a habit, in a groove, and grooves can easily become ruts without us realising it. 
Now, the second step here is once you've got that list of all the steps is to, you know, actually then ask some questions to evaluate each of those elements. Asking questions like, is that the smartest way to do it? The fastest way to do it? You know, are there gaps? Are there areas of duplication? I remember coming across one big print company in the UK who went through this exercise and they discovered from the point where someone walked into their print business to get a print job done to the point where they picked up their print job at the end, from those two points, staff members in this print shop would write out by hand 32 separate times the customer's name, address and phone number. And they had no idea they were wasting so much time and energy because no one had gone to the trouble of actually itemising out all the stuff they were currently doing. Now, the third step here is to innovate, to actually look at those elements that don't make sense, that aren't probably the best way to do things, that haven't kept up with consumers as they've changed, and look at how, how do you do that differently. And the fourth step is to put it all back together again. The mistake I see so many clients make, though, in doing this is they jump into this innovation piece without asking the most important question of all. And there's a question that Andy and, I, Andy and I were talking about before this afternoon began, and that's the question of who are we and why do we exist? What, what business are we in? And I've done a lot of work in the last two years consulting in the direct selling space, particularly with party plan companies. You know, companies like Tupperware and Mary Kay and Nutramedics. And if you think about it, their business models were set for an era that no longer exists. The whole party plan business was set up for 60s suburban America and Australia when women stayed at home and wanted a bit of independence and financial security. And yet, things have changed. Not only have demographics changed, but technology has changed. And many of these big companies are looking to re-engineer how they do things. The mistakes so many of them are making is they're thinking, oh, we'll just make everything high tech. And yet you think about that business full of women that, what makes those businesses work is relationships. It's the high touch, it's the face-to-face, -face, it's a sense of community and rapport. And sadly, many of these businesses, not the three that I've mentioned, but many others, have gone so far down the track of making everything high-tech, they've actually eroded the DNA of what their businesses are about, which is the high-touch stuff. Now, one of the really good examples I've seen of uh, a direct selling company that hasn't done this is a big, you know, a big linen party plan company I worked with a few months ago. And they realised that the relationship piece was the most important, but to look at their ordering process, it was extraordinarily outdated. Up until a few years ago, if you went to one of their parties, at the end of the party, the host would get out a form, a booklet, and in that would have the, the, the main form and the carbon copy form, and they would write out your name, address, phone number, the serial number of the product you were ordering, the price, they'd add up the price. They'd then go home and ring up head office and ring through the orders for everyone that had come to the party. The products would come, you would deliver them, take payment, give them a receipt, and it was so cumbersome. They've developed this brilliant iPad app so now at the end of a party, the woman, the host gets out the iPad, everything's Windows based, or sorry, everything's image based, they you know, touch on the button for whatever the product is, they put in the quantity. They can do an invoice that goes immediately to the inbox of the customer. They do the credit card payment there and then on the spot. And the time it has saved is phenomenal. How much more professional and streamlined. They've completely re-engineered their business, but what's great about them is they haven't compromised on what makes them who they are, the high touch people stuff. And that's such a key distinction to make as you do this. And yet the, the point I find that most of my clients struggle with the most is this third one, the innovation piece. How do, you, how do you think of new ways to do old stuff? And that actually leads us nicely into the second thing that enduring brands do to stay relevant. And that is they're constantly reframing. And you know, reframing is really, if you break it down, it's, it's about actively looking to see things from a different perspective or a different point of view. Because if you think about it, we were, we were all raised being told a lie. And that lie was that great minds think alike. It's not true. Of course it's not true. Think about it throughout history. The greatest minds from Copernicus to Galileo, more recently in the business world, Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs, they didn't see the world like everyone else. They didn't even see the world like all the other brilliant people of their time. They saw it differently through a different lens. And this goes to the, the heart of the whole issue of creativity and innovation. And can I put it to you, right now in your businesses, in your teams, the most valuable asset you've got for innovation and creativity is the set of freshest eyes on your team. It may well be the new person who's come into the business from outside of the industry. Or it may well be that young Gen Y employee. Because, of course, what do Gen Y do when they come in? They ask that quick, the key question, the question of why. Why do we do it that way? And that is such a powerful question. Because the beauty of people with fresh eyes is they have no trouble thinking outside the box because they've got no idea what the box even looks like just yet. 
And more importantly, they sort of don't care all that much. I reckon one of the best examples I've seen of the power of fresh eyes in innovation would have to be IKEA. Do you know, in the early days of Ikea, they used to sell um, ready-made furniture, pre-assembled furniture. So if you went to buy a table or a chair from Ikea, it actually came as a table or a chair, like phenomenal. And so you would go to this, not an Allen key in sight. And um, in the early days, they were having a catalogue photo shoot at one point for some of their products. And at the end of the photo shoot, Ikea's marketing manager, some of their warehouse staff were putting the stock back into the truck to go back to the warehouse. And there was this one table that would not fit back in the truck. No matter which way they, they angled or moved it, this thing would not go back into the truck. And standing at a distance was the photographer, packing up his gear, the guy who'd taken the photos for the catalogue, who knew presumably very little about tables and inventory and all that stuff. He saw them wrestling with this table and said, hey guys, like why don't you take the legs off? It seemed perfectly obvious to him, but they were so close to it, they couldn't even see that as a possibility. And they went, that's a good idea, let's do it. Do you know that one question from that one photographer that day, it became the seed of an idea that became the basis of Ikea's entire flat pack business model. From someone with fresh eyes, that one question changed everything. Now, having assembled my fair share of Ikea furniture over the years, I often wonder how many relationship breakdowns that one photographer um, is responsible for around the globe. Yeah, but that's the power of fresh eyes. I mean, sadly, what often happens in businesses Someone with fresh eyes comes in and they're inadvertently told, sit in the corner. Watch how we do things around here. Once you know how we do things around here, then and only then can you offer some input or suggestions. By that time, they haven't got fresh eyes anymore. They've got the same blink as the rest of us do and they can't see the opportunities that everyone else has already missed. You know, one of the best examples I've seen this from a, a technology point of view is in Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft have been described as having had a lost decade in the 2000s. There was a fascinating Vanity Fair article last year that, that talked about this, Microsoft's lost decade. It's a fascinating read. One of the key points in this article that I came across was that in 2003, one of Microsoft's Gen Y software developers noticed that all of his college buddies when they were using um, AOL's AIM instant messaging program, they were making use of something that AIM had just developed, which was a status feature. And the status feature was people could say, go into, go into, the, you know, go into the pool or go into the beach or studying for college finals or whatever it was, just putting up a sentence about what they were doing. And this young, fresh eyes software engineer at Microsoft went to his superior and said, hey, have you considered that we might want to put a status feature in the MSN? product as well. And his boss said, are you serious? How inane? Why would anybody want to put up a sentence about themselves online for their friends to see? What is that all about? Now, what did that engineer, he noticed the embryonic stages of the social networking revolution. And with fresh eyes, he saw the opportunity. And yet his boss dismissed it and they missed, they missed that boat. It was Facebook or MySpace first and then Facebook that, that rode that wave and Microsoft missed it. That's the power of fresh eyes. Now, the last or the third and final thing that enduring brands are constantly doing is, is repositioning themselves and their brands as times change. And again, we could talk about a whole pile of examples of companies that have done this, but I reckon one of the best examples would have to be Lego. I'm sure some of you are Lego fans when you were kids. Lego started in 1934 in Denmark making wooden toys. A few years later, their founder you know, came across this brand new technology called plastic. And he said, that's interesting, let's use it. Lego is in fact one of the first toy companies in the world to invest in a plastic injection moulding machine. He developed these iconic blocks and very quickly Lego shot to prominence in the 40s and 50s as the toy of choice. Now what they did is they kept repositioning their brand to stay ahead of the marketplace and ahead of the competition. They didn't just stop at blocks. Now, they, they developed things like the play sets that released in 19, um, the late 1950s. And then in the, in the 70s they released the Lego figurine, the little Lego man. And all these things kept them ahead of the curve. And Lego were doing well until the late 80s and the early 90s. Because in that time, shifts began happening in the toy industry. And it was driven by the fact that kids were now more interested in playing an Atari than playing with their Lego. In one two-year period, Lego lost $500 million. They turned losses for 10 years straight. And they're in this position like, well, what the heck do we do? The, the, I mean, a shift has happened here. And in a stroke of brilliance, what Lego did is they repositioned their brand. They realised, well, if you can't beat them, join them. 
And so in the late 90s, early 2000s, Lego went into a series of licensing agreements with some of the big movie franchises like Indiana Jones and Batman and Star Wars, and they released their own range of video games. More recently, they've gone ahead and made a thing called Lego Universe, which is one of these what they call massively multiplayer online games, a phenomenal piece of technology. Now, even more recently, the last two or three years, they've developed iPhone apps that allow you to actually build shapes on your smartphone using Lego pieces. I mean, what a brilliant example of a company that has never lost their soul. They're still about creativity and play and imagination, but the way they've done things, the way they've connected with the marketplace is completely different, and they've stayed relevant as a result. Now, when I'm working with clients, helping them reposition their brands, there are a series of seven questions that I work through that we've only got a few moments, so we're going to go through them very quickly, but you might want to jot these down to take back to your teams and actually look at it as a bit of a memory or an idea jogging exercise or a brainstorming exercise. First question in repositioning any brand is a question of what motivates and impresses our market? What do they actually really want? And it may be very different to what they said they wanted two years ago. And this is the challenge. Of course, the second question is the very opposite, which is the question of what confuses, disappoints or frustrates our marketplace? Now, in both of these questions, the key is, of course, not to fall back on assumptions, like, we, well, we sort of know what we, our customers want, to actually ask them, to really find out, to get inside their heads. And from a digital perspective, you'll be amazed the opportunities this actually leads to when you take the time to really know what's making your customers tick. Orbitz, the big travel company in the States, realised this a couple of years back. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal last October talking about the fact that Orbitz were starting to do research on who it was that was using their services, and they discovered that people who used um, Apple-based devices spent 30% more on hotel accommodation per booking than those who used a Windows-based PC. So guess what Orbitz did, armed with this knowledge? They started to manipulate the search results. So if you're using an Apple device, you will naturally see the more expensive hotels at the top of your list. It's a good reason to have a PC floating around somewhere, because okay, you can just use it for Orbitz. Yeah, but, one, but by knowing who their customers were and what made them tick, they could actually become far more strategic. Some could say manipulative. The third question in repositioning is who else is currently solving our market's problems? If they're not coming to you, who are they going to and why not you? Fourth question, how are we currently seen or perceived? And this is an interesting question because sometimes what you find out is not comfortable. And the best way to do this is actually to use some of these social media monitoring sites like Cred or Clout because they give you a real insight into what the buzz around your brand is in the marketplace. Um, number five, how are you a category of one? A good example of this is... Um, over in the US, Walmart realised that the Amazon price check app was highly annoying, and so they developed their own series of apps to combat it. One of them was this genius piece of software called ShopiCat. ShopiCat allows a, a, a customer to go into a Walmart store and to use their friends' likes and shares on Facebook to develop really targeted, intelligent you know, gift suggestions. And what a brilliant piece of technology, and Walmart are the only ones that have got it. Number, what up to six, where are the gaps? Certainly, where are the gaps in your marketplace? But also, where are the gaps in service delivery? And this was an interesting question that Australia Post asked last year. They realised that people were buying more stuff online, but the challenge with that is people then get things delivered when they are at work. And so Australia Post developed these, these lockers that now allow you to have something delivered during the day. You go at night once you finish work to actually pick that parcel up. And they're now developing refrigerated ones, so if you order your groceries online, you can go after hours and get the stuff you weren't available to receive during the day. Brilliant solution to servicing the gap. And the seventh question here is the question of what are your market's unknown future needs? What is the stuff they're going to want in a few years' time that they don't even know they want yet? I often think of this as the Steve Jobs question, because this was the genius of Steve Jobs. He never waited until customers asked for something. He always provided things for the market before the market even knew they wanted them. And he didn't wait for a, a consumer survey to say, you know, we'd really love something that was a cross between a MacBook and an iPhone. That'd be awesome. He didn't wait for that. He made an iPad. Remember when they came out, people said, who would ever want an iPad? And then six months later, we all went, how do we live without these things? That's the genius of Steve Jobs. And if you can get ahead of the marketplace in this way and position your brand, the market will beat a path to your door. All right, what I'll just do is I'll put my details up on the screen. Feel free to have a look at our website. There's a whole pile of um, stuff on there, a whole lot of articles that will build on a few of the things that we've talked about 
this afternoon, just PDFs that you can print off. So feel free to have a look at those if they would be useful. Um, as was mentioned before, there are, you probably saw on the way, and there's a couple of copies of this outside. So if you've got teenagers, or if you're looking to connect with that Gen Y cohort, and this will hopefully give you a bit of an insight into, I guess, what does make them tick, but also Gen Z, because they're the ones coming. And they're age 14 and under, and they're fascinating. They're a bit like Gen Y on steroids, so that's exciting. Um, so um, there's a whole lot about them. So feel free to have a look at that if that would be useful. Um, there's also people are asking about the, the book on this topic. Um, there's a book called Winning the Battle for Relevance, which should be out in May. And it's all about this research around why iconic brands are faltering and you know, how we can learn from their experiences. So if you want me to let you know, I can just shoot you an email when that comes out. Just drop in a business card at that little table and we can let you know when that comes out. But it should be in stores mid-May or so, if any of the bookstores still exist at that point. Um, so before we wrap up, I'm not sure on what memories from your childhood stick with you most clearly now that you're a, a big kid. Um, but for me, I reckon some of the memories that are most vivid is when my dad used to um, take my, my brothers and I sailing on a lake near our house, and our yacht was about an eighth the size of that yacht, and we would go out on Lake Illawarra, near where I grew up, and one, one Sunday afternoon we were out on the lake, and this massive summer storm blew up out of nowhere, and my dad was one of these fathers who sort of felt it was his role that whenever something went wrong in life, it was his responsibility to turn it into a teaching, op a teaching exercise, maybe some of you had dads like that, and my dad was also a school teacher, so he did this better than most, and um, so I remember this day, this massive storm blew up, gale force winds, and my dad decided that would be the day he would teach me how to sail into a headwind, which is a key skill for every eight-year-old, and so um, my dad, being a school teacher, said, okay, there are three rules to sailing into a headwind. First rule, he said, is you cannot change the wind. We've got to accept that first up. Can't do a thing about it. As much as we might like to, it's out of our control. Second rule he said is, we cannot fight the wind. He said, we're an unpowered vessel. We're at the mercy of the elements here. Third rule he said is, we cannot ignore the wind. If we do nothing, we're going to get blown off course. Now, if you think about it, those, those very same rules apply in business from a strategic point of view. I mean, sometimes we talk about change be it changes in consumers or changes in the marketplace. We talk about change as being like the headwinds of change. You see a lot of businesses right now who are hell-bent on changing the wind or fighting the wind. I mean, Jerry Harvey's all-out war on online retailing is an example of that. And it's understandable why he's doing so. Then you see others who ignore the wind. They think if we just ignore the change long enough, it'll go away and stuff will get back to how it was in the late 90s. That was a cool time. And it won't. I mean, any of you who are yachties, you'd know that my dad taught me that day, the only way to sail into a headwind is to tack, to go with the wind rather than against it. It's exactly the same in organisations in business. I mean, in the years to come, as consumers continue to change and the marketplace evolves, if you're going to win the battle to stay relevant, remember the words of Charles Darwin when he said this, it is not the strongest that survive, nor the most intelligent. That's encouraging. He said, no, it is those who are most responsive to change. So I hope that was useful and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I'll pass back to Andy. Cheers. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Michael. That was fantastic. So we are going to move into a, a Q&A session now. So there are a number of people with uh, handheld mics uh, dotted around the room, or they're actually at the back of the room. Um, so what we'll do if you uh, have a question for Michael, please raise your hand. One of the uh, um, uh, helpers will run along and give you the microphone, and then we'll, uh, we'll take from there. So anybody like to kick us off? Just raise your hand if you have any questions. Gentleman here. There's a microphone on its way. If the Q&A stops now, do I get the prize? <laughs> Depends how long your question you is. You might get all of them. <laughs> Um, I was interested in your comments around the sort of the death of the gatekeeper. Um, I guess one of the one of the trends that seems to be evolving rapidly is just the breadth of data that's available both to business and to consumers. And I guess in some ways that, to me, reinforces the role of a gatekeeper. In as much as it's less about um, giving you access to information that's not available, but it is about disseminating information because there's so much information that you know it's almost impossible to filter through it so i'd be interested in your thoughts around that yeah and it's so, a and so, so good insight you're spot on and i mean that's what gatekeepers in the future will be doing it's about taking information and turning it into knowledge or advice 
And in the past, often it's just been about controlling the flow of knowledge, but now that control is out of the control of the, out of the hands of the gatekeeper. I mean, looking at, for instance, the, um, the travel sector, that's, that's the good news for the travel industry, is that the survey done that looked at how many consumers were using online sources to book holidays, in the same survey they asked, what's your number one frustration with booking a holiday? And they said, the time involved in the abundance of information. And if you've booked a holiday, you know, you go on to TripAdvisor and it's just like, oh my word, like you could spend days. And as people get more and more aware of my time is money, you know, should I outsource that? And so as much as they've now gone, I want control, I suspect in the next few years we'll see a, a resurgence of outsourcing because people are like, there's just too much now. The challenge is so many, so many travel agents, as an example, to follow that through, are still stuck in the we're the providers of knowledge. We have our brochures hidden behind a desk. You come in, you sit at a desk, and it's like a... I mean, you look at a travel agency as a model. Hasn't evolved in 30 years. You still go in, and it's like a job in interview. You sit there, they've got a computer, they tap on the computer, you can't see the screen, okay, because that's hidden. And so the challenge for them is, as, as, you know, as they look to solve that problem of too much information, they will need to then change the way they operate as businesses. And that's the sticking point, because it will require re-engineering, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. It's a good point, though, absolutely. It's a great question. Anybody else? Hands up. Gentleman there. Uh, Michael, I just wanted to pick up on your point regarding uh, Gen Z, and I suppose what we've been talking about today is recalibrating approach to Gen Y. Uh, mm -hmm. But in chasing Gen Y, um, is it a case of having to have an eye on Gen Z, so you, you miss what's coming at you in terms of recalibrating towards Gen Y? Yep, it's a good question. The good news is the stuff, I mean, what we're seeing so far in Gen Y, someone died. Um, the, good news, the good news is about Gen Z is what we've seen so far, even though they're young, is that the same stuff that works for Gen Y works for Gen Z. Doesn't work for Gen X. I mean, X is a cynical bunch. They're like, don't spin me anything, but it's, it's in a different way. Um, and so for Gen Y, what works for them will work for Gen Z, so that's the good news there, but certainly you're right. I mean, right now, organisations need to be thinking about Gen Z because at age 14, you look at the, I mean, the, the surveys that look at who influences a parent's buying decision, and it's far more the kids than it is the media or even the, the peers of the parent. And so if you're looking to influence baby boomers or even Gen Xs, it'll be through their kids. And so in that sense, you do need to understand Gen, Gen Z because they're the influencers in a household. But the, yeah, the good news is that what, what works with Gen Y tends to work with Gen Z too. Gentleman at the front here. He's a parent of three Gen Zs. I'm frightened to death, I've got to tell you. So. <laughs> you mentioned that, sorry, you mentioned that Gen Y, you've got to market to Gen Y, sorry, market through Gen Y, I think mm. that you mentioned. Gen Y often hangs around other Gen Y social group, so how do you market, I suppose, through Gen Y to actually get to Gen Y? Have you got any examples of that? Yeah, you, oh, you give them, I mean, the examples are anything that goes viral. You give them something to share that is a bit controversial, something that's, I mean, the, the three R's, raw, random and real. Those are the three things. If you, want to, if you give something, whether it's a story or a video piece or a fact or, you know, any of you that spend half your life on Facebook like I do, you see the stuff that comes through that generates the, the huge responses of likes and comments. That's what works. Or the stuff on Twitter that gets retweeted. And typically, I mean, that's how you put something out there. And that's why having Gen Ys in your organisation is you get the Gen Ys in your organisation to put it to their peers. And if it's good enough, it'll get beyond that. Um, but certainly it can't come from you as the brand. So, for instance, if Bankwest's Facebook page puts something out there, there'll be a guardedness. Well, it's a business, it's a corporation, it's probably not really a person. And so the challenge then is how do you get people within a brand to be the ambassadors for that brand? Um, and if you do that in a way that's too contrived or ma manipulative, it'll backfire. Because if then people go, well, you're just being paid by your boss to put stuff on Facebook, it's not authentic. Um, so there's no set way. It depends on the type of brand, it depends on who you've got influence over. But start with those you've got influence over and use them to market through them to, their mar to the marketplace. Um, good example of that would be, um, you asked for an example, Volvo. When they released the S40, which was their big brand repositioning in 2004, they went from being the boxy beige, boring, wear a bowler's hat type car to being sexy and fast and young and cool. Um, one of the key things they did is they, they had this doc, a mockumentary they designed called The Mystery of Dalaro. And Dalaro was a town somewhere in Europe and it was this mockumentary that was all fake. But um, it, it, was, it was fake, not in an inauthentic sense, but in a sort of this mystery you know, that involved this new Volvo car in this little town. And, it was so compelling that people shared this video so widely that the jump in sales was huge. So as a case study, that's a very interesting one to look at. 
And the, yeah, the documentary was The Vis Mystery of Dalaro, which is D-A-L-A-R-O. So it's a good one to look at. On to that, one of the things that I was really uh, surprised about in uh, about 12 months ago, one of the most successful pieces of marketing that our parent CBA um, did um, was they offered uh, free cinema tickets when you opened a particular type of savings account. It absolutely went viral. It was phenomenally successful. And I think this concept of deals as opposed to marketing and pushing traditional products is an example about how you, 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 know, you re-engineer and you repackage and you reframe things for the target audience as opposed to they weren't really selling the accounts, they were selling the deal of actually the cinema tickets. And that was a thing that, was, uh, that went viral uh, and, and was very, very successful for them. But great question. Uh, any other questions? Just maybe while there isn't a hand up, I, I just had one myself, uh, Michael, as I was sitting there. You talked a lot about how organizations can respond to these sorts of um, challenges and some examples of organizations that have got it right. What do you think is the single biggest challenge, in your opinion, to why organizations don't respond? Um, the most the common denominator often is that arrogance, complacency. So under a banner, the intoxication of success. When a business is so successful for so long that they start to develop this sense of invincibility um, because then they become closed-minded, they become complacent, they become conceited. Um, and also, so there's four Cs. The other one is there's a, a culture of conformity. So once a, once a company is successful for a long time, they tend to attract people that all think the same. And therefore, you develop groupthink, collective blind spots. And the most common thing in Kodak is the best example of that. Um, a company that was so big for so long that they almost became a hostage of their own success. And that, that's a very, very common reason why businesses are firstly unaware of where they need to change or are unwilling to change because they have this sense that we've got it all figured out. Yeah, there's a famous sporting analogy. I'm sorry if, uh, if there aren't any English soccer fans in the, in the room, but uh, um, the Manchester United manager, Alex Ferguson, he has a, an expression. He says, you always buy when you're at your strongest. Mm. Um, and the, the point being that just because you're at the top of the game and you might be the best side around, that's the point in which you should be seeking to reinvent yourselves and find the new stars, uh, as opposed to just being complacent and, uh, and sticking with what you have. Mm. Uh, any other questions? So I think there was a hand down there as well. So one there, one there. Whoever can get the mic first. Ah, oh, that gentleman there. Um, <clears throat> okay, my name is Christopher. I have been in Australia for uh, 17 years. I am importer and a wholesaler. I supply the homeware industry. And uh, since last year, I have seen uh, the internet retailer coming on the market and taking a big share of the traditional uh, retailer. And you were talking about the gatekeeper. And I'm wondering if it's possible that uh, as a wholesaler, I become a gatekeeper as well. And uh, I am a middle person. And uh, before you provide your answer, I would like to tell you that I've got all my loan with Bankwest. <laughs> so please, uh, please be nice. <laughs> Get this man a drink. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> yeah, the question about whether you're a gatekeeper is a very valid one, because in many cases what we're seeing is that gatekeeper role can just be pushed up the supply chain. Um, whether you're a gatekeeper or not can be a matter of semantics. Um, the, the question is, are you connecting with your marketplace? Do they have access to your information? Or is there a sense of trying to control that flow of information and access to services? And if you're not doing that, um, you shouldn't, you, there's no reason you will fall into the same trap that maybe a retailer does who goes, this is our stuff, don't you dare. Um, and there's lots of examples of, of retail stores that are still in that situation where they're trying to hold tight everything about their business. And you know, that, that is a basically a 20th century model of business success, trying to control the flow of information and, and resources. And you, know, you talk about Thomas Friedman's world, the, the book, The World is Flat. I mean, we're in a position now where people have got more control and holding on to and trying to constrict. I mean, that's, that's really the surest path to, to a fall. I hope that speaks to the point. I think there's a question down here, gentlemen. Uh, just thinking about, I guess, from businesses like whether it's a retail banking or whether it's a shoe store, uh, the physical retail presence has always been very critical to, mm. to that business for driving, whether it's customer relationships or driving sales. Yep. As we sort of shift away from a, a physical channel and into a, an online channel, uh, where I guess you're now opening yourself up potentially to global competitors as well, it's no mm. longer relevant that I've got a presence in this suburb or that suburb. Yep. How is, uh, you know, have you got any views around, you know, as we sort of head down a sort of an online strategy, how do we 
get effective at driving engagement and actually using the, the online channel to, to drive sales as well. So a couple of things, you see stores, and Korea's ahead of us in this. So South Korea about 18 months ago developed a lot of retail stores started having virtual stores. And some retailers here have started it, but not to great effect yet. Where at train stations in Seoul now, you can actually take a QR code scan of a whole lot of products and do your shopping for groceries while you're at the train station. Um, so for them, they're trying to take their wares outside of, like you say, outside of that, that can, the confines of a local retailer to where consumers are, are waiting and are bored anyway. Um, so that, that's one example. I think what we'll see more of is where the retail store does become just the showroom. So you go there to, to have that experience. So retailers, instead of going, oh, we hope they buy from us, but they might not. We know that they're all going online. Okay, let's be honest. You're all going online anyway, so let's just acknowledge that that's now the status quo. How do we have stores that are fun and engaging where you can build a relationship where you can touch and feel and, and see the product? And Clinique are a good example. Over in the States, Clinique last year, complete about face on their approach to displaying products. If you go into a Clinique store in the US today, every drawer is open. Every price is displayed. Um, they've adopted a completely hands-off approach, whereas five years ago it was very much a hands-on. You've, you've, you, the store person's got to be with you, they've got to be there every step of the way. Clinique and Sephora did this first. Um, so they're the two that have you know, really led that market. So now the retail store becomes a place we have an experience. Bear in mind that you'll probably go online and buy it. So then how does that retailer become the compelling place where you go on and buy after you've experienced? So you have a whole pile of iPads around the store where people can go on and make that purchase. And it won't be from the store, there won't be any stock there on hand, it's going to be online. I think what's interesting is that increasingly what, I, what we're seeing in, in financial services is um, less of a, a channel migration from people saying, oh, well, the store's dead, it's now about online, or the contact center's dead, it's now about online. It's around um, uh, really seeing uh, there being one channel which is, uh, and that process being the same, irrespective of how the customer actually wants to engage with you. And because for some people, they may wish to want to start online and then engage with somebody, whether that's on the telephone or even on a web, web chat, or they may then want to come in and have a real conversation with a person or a mobile banking manager or whatever it may be. So I think it, it plays very much to uh, some of those um, reframing, repositioning, re-engineering points that, that Michael was saying. It's not so much a migration, it's more how do you actually connect these, these different channels to actually provide a seamless experience for, for your customers customer. And I guess that will be different across different industries. And for me, it will be the people that can uh, really pull that off as opposed to saying, right, we'll shut down that and every, we're going to you know, put everything on black. Um, so it's, uh, but it's a big challenge. We've probably got time for one or two questions. One question, I think. Oh, gentleman at the back. Yeah, just going back to um, communicating to Generation Y, you said we had to uh, communicate through the people to get there. Um, as we understand it now, uh, like Facebook and YouTube is uh, the most popular uh, social media uh, forms uh, uh, medium. Uh, is that still the, the best way to go, go uh, to reach out to them? And what would, what, are there any other mediums that we can uh, have a look at now and in the future possibly? At the moment, they're the, they're the dominant ones, particularly Facebook. I mean, nothing comes close to the influence of Facebook. Um, on this generation. Um, I think what we've seen already, as Facebook continues to get more and more annoying, i.e. changing the rules and forcing people to play to that game, they have to be pretty careful because if people get fed up, I mean, I've spoken to three people of my age in the last week who've said they've just closed their Facebook accounts. Um, and I think we're, we could begin to see a tipping point away from Facebook, but I mean, that realistically is gonna be at least 12 to 18 months away if any time in the medium term. I mean, they're a very agile company. I, I can't see them making huge decisions because they don't seem to be affected by that intoxication yet. Um, but at the moment, Facebook would be the, m even more than YouTube, I would say. Facebook would be the thing. Um, Instagram is there, Pinterest is there, but Facebook would be the primary one. Okay, unfortunately we have run out of time for the formal part of the questions. Now, the good news is uh, Michael is gonna be sticking around for a bit uh, for, for a drink or, uh, or a softie out there, so uh, please feel free to uh, uh, 
uh, to grab him, uh, so to speak, if you've got any sort of further follow-ups. Now, we've got one order of business just to, uh, to conclude. We have got three copies, signed copies, uh, of Michael's book to give away. Uh, unfortunately, Michael, I'm going to put you on the spot. We have to pick uh, what we think were the sort of three best questions out of that, uh, out of that lot, unless you're prepared to sign a few more books. Well, in the interest of self-esteem, no one's really the winner. Everyone gets a prize <laughs> now. Isn't that awkward how that happens in schools now? Um, how about just the first three people that come up to the front at the end? It's like the price is right. Is that easy? So that the first great. three questioners that get to the front, the books are yours. So that'll do. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Michael McQueen. I think I can switch on to these ones now, just a, a few uh, closing remarks. So look, um, I'd just like to, again, thank Michael uh, for his time and, uh, and fantastic uh, insights, which I'm sure um, have stimulated a lot of thought uh, across uh, all of us here in the room. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for taking uh, a couple of hours out of, I'm sure, uh, really busy and hectic schedules uh, for supporting the uh, Bank West Connect series here this afternoon. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And finally, just one more mention. Uh, as I said at the start, um, the uh, guys will be walking around with the uh, online evaluation. See, we've removed paper. Uh, Michael, hope you noticed that. Um, the online evaluation forms on the iPads, and uh, as I said, five dollars for every one of those that we complete to a fantastic cause in the uh, uh, for the flying doctors service. So, uh, remains for me just to close the event. Please join us uh, for a few drinks and an opportunity for some further questions of Michael and some networking. And thank you very much again for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.